Sure. Being that it's health information, you're going to say that you put it on, let's say, uh, a Google or Amazon or something, and you use an air car service. Uh, based on your, your presentation, you said one thing you want to do is make sure that there's an understanding that you own the data. Okay. And in the case of a, of a breach, who's responsible? The person as, as yourself saying that you're owning the data or Amazon saying this is where the information is housed? Right. Um, the, in the case of the breach, in, in the way that, and again, um, oh, point to Dan too to correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the way that Amazon is set up, right, you're responsible for securing your account, your data. Um, so if there's a breach, more than likely it was become because you gave your password out or someone else got that password because your infrastructure sits on top. Um, if you want to fire up a server and allow everyone to have root access, um, you can run that on Amazon, but they can only get in to your sandbox. So 99% um, of the time, you're responsible. Um, now with Google, it's a little bit different. Google, they don't sandbox your environment. They share your environment and they don't necessarily say in their agreement that they're not gonna read your data. So the fact, um, for example, Gmail. Gmail is a widely used email, but it's not HIPAA compliant. Because Google won't say that they're not going to read your data. So if you send patient data through a, a Gmail account, you are violating PHI. Because Google is going to read that, and they're reading it to serve you ads, but they're reading it nonetheless. Um, so um, it's, really, it's really important to get into the level of agreements with um, the, the cloud vendors and understand what they're um, offering and understand how you, you um, need to approach that. And um, there's several use cases, and we obviously use Amazon because of that, because we're very comfortable with how they protect um, our assets, and they're our assets. So, yep. so you said you've been in the cloud for a while. Yeah. Yeah, um, so the question is, is um, uh, has Amazon evolved since 2008 in a good way or a bad way? And from my standpoint, it's evolved in a good way. Um, they continue to provide us with the low-level API support um, to provide, uh, again, and, and sort of the nature of our shop is we've got probably um, 30 servers running in the cloud we have nine developers and one IT person. So what it does is it allows us not to have five or six IT people um, managing servers, managing the downtime, the uptime, the backups, all of that. They can, Amazon continues to release offerings that don't try to tell you what to do, but allow you to use low level tools um, to automate certain things that um, frankly, take a, um, a lot of time otherwise. I to, to jump on that. We have 600 servers, and until the last you know, month, uh, I was doing that. And that's mm -hmm. different than 2008, or is that uh, just sort no, of the nature of the beast? Since the since that's kind of the nature of the beast. I, Amazon is just continuously releasing new building blocks, like new features, and they release them faster than you know your developers can like go incorporate. Like, oh, now they have DNS. Oh, now they have database, oh, no, they have it. I do, you know, and um, you don't feel obligated to use every single one of their services, you know, you pick and choose, you're like, oh, we could do this, that really enable us to do something else, you know? and you know, kind of push more down the stack that you can build on top of, instead of starting with bare metal and building up everything. I would say it's almost better just to go sign up for Amazon services and get their mail, you can kind of like go and use their services, you have no idea you can do so much, you know, but like you start, their emails, they're reading, they're like, oh, this week they release X, Y, and Z features. And, and they drop the prices. Yeah. Every other month. They're like, oh, bandwidth is cheaper. Oh. They're, they're very. 
they, they provide so many features that it makes it very hard to leave, right? When, you know, um, in my, my situation, um, I, I think that they really do do an, uh, probably, and again, I, I, I don't have a lot of basis, but I do know, you know, Terra Mark does a really good job as well. Um, but they just continue to read your mind almost. You're like, oh man, I wish I had RDS, relational database. And then as soon as, you know, uh, six, six weeks, uh, six months later, bam, they have that. Or, uh, you know, I wish I could be able to create read replica slaves without having to fire up separate servers. They make it to where you push a button. Um, uh, so they have a lot of um, things and, and a lot of things going. So they're constantly listening to feedback. And um, one of the things that they released recently is anybody can sign up and use a free account. You do not have to have um, a pay account. You can go in and fire up a server and um, run Ruby on Rails or run any application you want it on it for free um, for I think a year. So um, there's a lot of it's a great place to go and play and understand what the cloud can do. Yeah, so w what is the best way to manage failover? And I think it really depends on, on your needs. Um, our needs, we started in 2007 in a bootstrap method, so our funds were, were really low. Um, so what we developed, um, and, and uh, I believe it's an open source project, but we developed um, what we call a slurper, right? Um, that actually sits in our office um, and pulls down the database over SSL and stores that. Um, and then we also have scripts that we use, DevOps scripts like Chef, things like that, that really is a command line. And we say instead of US East, US West. And again, our infrastructure would deploy in US West. Um, so we don't have a concurrent real-time disaster recovery. We have um, the, the data and, and we can shift it over. But you can set up configurations, as you said, that are concurrent. And um, Amazon has a, a proven security model to secure that data bridge um, uh, successfully. Um, and, and I believe that they use you know, the VPN tunneling um, architecture to ship data between coast hosted sites. But Dan, you may be more familiar with it. Yeah. Well, we run Ruby, so the database will never be as slow as Ruby. <laughs> no. Uh, I'm just kidding, um, but yeah, we understand. We understand that it's not as fast as if you're on the bare metal, um, and, and it's really a, a trade-off. And um, we really focus on response time on our app, um, and we're constantly measuring when someone clicks a button that they're getting a, a response back within two seconds. You know, no longer than two or three seconds on a response. So we keep our reads as fast as possible. But absolutely, it's a slow. It's um, slower than if you were running um, on bare metal. But what we, we haven't seen our users um, um, complain about speed. And, and one of the things that, that we, we do is oftentimes if they are, it's something in, in our code that we need to address. 
Um, so what the cloud gives us is the ability to sort of turn the dial up and say that there's a slow process running in our code. Even on a database read or write, there's queuing mechanisms, there's things you can do to maximize that using um, mem caching strategies and things like that. But if we discover a slowness, we just crank up for a limited amount of time the uh, number of apps that we're running. And that gives us time as, as developers to really solve the problem correctly versus trying to solve the problem um, in an, an emergent situation and end up causing more, um, more chaos than actually fixing it. Um, well, we've got several clients. I mean, that's sort of all of our clients. We've got several applications. Um, uh, as far as our uh, medication therapy management application, um, it's, it's running um, one database server, two read replicas, and then it's running, I think, about six application servers on Heroku um, during its high time, and then its low time, it runs one at night. So. Uh, most of our stuff is, uh, and, and how do we scale? Um, we scale horizontally. Um, Ruby, again, runs slow, right? And most of our stuff is in, in Ruby, but um, it's actually um, uh, consumes a lot of memory. But having multiple um, small servers horizontally is more effective for us with our language with Ruby than having one big server and having all that memory but having low CPU usage. So we, we scale horizontally, and we, we actually, um, in that instance, use Heroku to scale across so that we just turn the dial and they manage that horizontal load. Do you ever shut the down entirely? Like, you don't need um, you always have uh, We always have a baseline app running. Uh, we always have uh, at least one server running. So. All right. Thank you.